Slack has been the new darling for a while now, but you've really got the numbers to, to back that up. Um, I was looking, you have six million daily active users in more than 100 countries. 55% of those users are outside the United States from my understanding. So not only do you have like a super solid foundation, but you have plenty of room to grow. 43% uh, of these Fortune 100 companies use Slack. One of them is Liberty Mutual. Indeed. Which was founded in 1912 and still going strong, growing. So when I look at Slack, Slack was born organically as a communication tool from TinySpec. We talked about that a little bit earlier today. Could you explain channels and how this type of communication is different and better than maybe what we've used before? I would love to. So um, the, before I do, how many of you know that you're customers of Slack? And how many of you suspect that you might be unofficially? That's pretty good. So that's a on top of it group of CIOs. Um, the difference between channels and email um, or uh, addressing a message to a channel instead of addressing it to an individual, a group of individuals, is that um, it's much more accessible than it would otherwise be. So there's a couple of things that 10, 20 years from now will seem crazy about the use of email in corporate environments. And email definitely has its place. I don't think it's, we're going to have it for another um, many decades or maybe even many thousands of years to come. But there's two huge disadvantages to the use in team-based work. And one is that uh, messages are trapped in inboxes, so people just don't see them. You're having this conversation, and there's a constant tension between, on the one hand, I'd like to be kept in the loop, so please CC me. And on the other hand, I get way too much email, so quit CCing me on everything. Um, and then the second one is you have people starting at your companies uh, next week, next month, next year, and all of them will start with empty email inboxes, so completely cut off from the conversations that happened before you got there. And in the cases of large companies that have been around for a while, that can be hundreds of millions, billions, tens of billions of messages. Um, and that's, a, that's a just completely insane approach to the basic knowledge management of that day-to-day -day communication. So. Um, Channels, in contrast, are pull rather than push, depending on how you look at it. They're there um, accessible, even if they're not actually being accessed by everyone on the team. And uh, I'll give one quick example. Just um, We have accounts dash customer name for all of our big customers. And we were closing. Um, Oracle, who's now our second biggest customer about three months ago, and I was doing this demo, and I could go and see where we're at with the vendor approval process, the security review, the like, negotiating the terms, redline MSA back and forth, and um, that's great, so I didn't have to ask someone and get a, you know, compile a report and send it back, but it wasn't just me that had access. It was everyone um, at the company, theoretically, including engineers who were working on features that were blocked um, or were blocking the deployment at Oracle. And there's uh, that context is invaluable, and you never know exactly what context is going to be important. We can come back to that later. Cool. So, John, you use Slack at yep. Liberty Mutual, and actually, Stuart, you use. Liberty Mutual at Slack. That's true. We just switch <laughs> providers. Thank you. Uh, um, can you tell me a little bit about how you use Slack as a, as a tool and why do you like it? Why do you like it? Why do you not sure. like it? Sure. Uh, <laughs> love it. Uh, everyone should get it. Uh, but no, seriously, this was a from the ground up. Right? Our, our engineers um, basically said, started using it and said, we absolutely want to. Uh, use it more pervasively. We were doing a lot more agile development across the organization, and it really had taken off. It had taken off in terms of the free version. So as was mentioned earlier, in terms of the conversion, was people wanted, the developers wanted to convert to, well, I should say, the, the, the managers wanted to convert to the corporate version for some, for some security and data retention reasons. Um, but you know, one of the things was it was really about the ease of use. And every engineer was, when, when we, we upgraded to an enterprise agreement, uh, in the early days, we had some issues with our single sign-on internally. Nothing as a result of Slack, but more kind of how we implemented it. And we almost had a revolt, right? The developers are like, screw it. I'm, I'm going back to the free version. You know, Give me a call when, when you're ready. 
but I am not losing this productivity. And it really was this, this idea that I could be in touch with everyone on my team or other teams seamlessly, whether I was on my phone, on my work laptop, on my personal laptop, uh, where, wherever it was. And it was a really compelling um, value proposition that kind of snuck up on us, honestly. Uh, and, and again, this idea of empowering the, the engineers in, in the company, which is a new concept for a company like Liberty Mutual to, to really uh, start to empower that community. And we've, we've learned an awful lot with it. Now, Slack's not the only new enterprise tool that, you, that you're familiar with. Um, you headed up a bold experiment at Liberty Mutual where you, know, you brought something to market in just seven months, which is unusual for what it was. I'd love for you to share with the room about, sure. about what happened. We, we, uh, we were going into uh, a new business. We were extending our benefits business. This is a business that provides employers uh, long-term, short-term disability, other t hospital coverage, other types of benefit products that you would use through, through your own companies. We were entering a completely new area of the market. And the mantra was, act like a startup. And so the first step was get, sitting down with that business leadership team and saying, OK, so if we're really going to do this, then that means it's full Agile, full DevOps, released to production daily. Every developer owns their code through production, you know, all the things that you know, Pivotal and others, and I'm sure Slack you know, do, which was very unusual for a company like, like Liberty. And the, the business leadership team was, was, was impressed, and was impressed with the pitch, and said, sure, we're all in. And so the first step was, well, how are we going to do this? And we didn't hold a, a meeting or a committee to decide. We opened an uh, AWS account and started coding. Now, that kind of freaked out some people. Um, but we got past that, we worked past that, the business was our ally in that, and we took uh, from nothing to a full insurance platform, so quote to cash, claims, billing, everything, all financial transactions, everything native in AWS in seven months and went live. Mm -hmm. And it has, it really changed both the business's expectation of what you could achieve with a development organization and it really helped to really jumpstart what we were doing internally and some of these ideas that were, they were in pockets and they were nascent, but to be able to see the art of the possible and you know, in, in the large companies that, that many of the folks here represent, we, we hear about these things, we read about these things, it's like, well, it's not really possible in my environment, and we were able to do it. And that team and a number of other teams would never turn back. Well, if we made them turn back, they would leave, so we're not gonna make them turn back. <laughs> So how do you overcome, and this is for, for each of you, how do you overcome the nobody ever got fired for buying X argument? No, I mean, I think our culture has changed dramatically in the last uh, two, three years through, through a number of, and this isn't the only the, the experiment and the, the new business launch that I mentioned. And this has been this kind of constant evolution and one success, and there's been some, uh, some snafus, some failures, mm -hmm. but the beauty of this team is releasing over a thousand times a week to production. The beauty is they screw stuff up, but they can redeploy it. Um, and you know, all of the things that Pivotal uh, and others talk about, it really is real, and it's about just giving people that, that, that freedom. So. The culture is, is rapidly shifting so that it's not, I wouldn't say it's perfect, you know, but it's not so much that you know, if, if you don't go with the, you know, the, the marquee thing, you'll, you know, you'll be kind of banished. What about you, Stuart? How do you approach this as, as somebody coming in as a relative newcomer? I got this from Jeff Smith, who was CIO of IBM until uh, maybe eight months ago or so. IBM's our biggest customer, so we're very grateful. And um, he had a real, um, agenda, and I, you know, my lack of experience in this domain um, had me a little bit surprised at that. Like how it, he didn't view his role at IBM as one that was just supporting and enabling the use of technology, um, but he wanted to see wholesale change. And there's 380,000 employees there, um, and they have tens of thousands, like whole, you know, bigger than my hometown 
whole groups of people to move over from one methodology to another methodology. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, you look at both ends of the spectrum. So all of you presumably have some kind of agenda. So no one is an executive and just says, things are fine exactly as they are, steady on, we don't intend to change anything. The other hand, you look at what it's like to be uh, an end user inside of these organizations, of like, you know, just a regular employee, TV show The Office, the movie The Office Space, Dilbert, all of the common tropes of modern corporate life are, bosses are a bunch of idiots, I don't know what's going on, um, and it usually is that missing context, and what do the executives want? They want alignment, they want shared consciousness, they want to break down silos. The interesting thing is it's exactly the same thing. Like the people literally want, the, yeah. the bosses and, and the workers all want exactly the same thing. Um, so the force of that bottoms up swell that you experienced and the, the force we see often from executives, like kind of top down motion towards Slack um, is, it breaks right through that no one gets fired for X. And, and also I think we're, we're in more or less a new category um, and things are changing pretty rapidly so there isn't a big incumbent that we're displacing other than email and no one really owns email. Right. Yeah, so because communication is happening in all these new places, how do you keep it secure? By hiring great security people um, and doing our ISO 27001 and CSTAR. Um, <laughs> um, so what's interesting is a lot of the, the concerns were not what we originally anticipated. So very few breaches and very few um, actual incidents of data loss are like there's a black VT100 terminal with green text and people are doing crazy network hacks. Um, it's a lot of uh, you know, either bad actors internally or poorly implemented processes or poorly supervised um, processes. And, um, one of the big concerns from customers was this massive increase in transparency. So going from, you know, like maybe I have three basis points of percentage access to all the communication that's happening in the company to 30% or something like that. So many orders of magnitude more access to information. Now there's a lot of people seeing a lot of stuff that I didn't want them to see in the first place. So, you know, DLP can, can um, cover a small number of easily pattern matched data types. Um, but then there's a new, uh, almost like a sociological change that ha you have to have happen inside the company so that people take a little bit more responsibility for um, the kind of conversations they're having and at what scope. Um, I would say that 95% of the security and policy uh, related concerns are just like the regulatory and compliance concerns. In other words, they're about people as opposed to software. Mm. And what, what have you found yeah, I mean, I think in, people are generally inherently good, and you know, as humans, we're we have this natural tendency for self-preservation, right? Mm -hmm. So you cannot get in a car accident if you never drive your car. Um, it, it may inhibit your ability to travel, um, but you know, you don't swerve into oncoming traffic because there's a bad outcome. And so I think it's about this. And what I like about Slack is. The access to information and treating people with adults, like adults, and kind of giving them some guidelines, they can make the right decisions. People are releasing code to production, like I said, a thousand times a week. And it's not willy-nilly. They're trying to make sure that it's, it, it, it's completely checked, that the quality is there. And does every now and then uh, does something go wrong? Yep, you can change it. That's the beauty of software. You can change it quickly if you're if you're set up in that in that model, and I think the other thing is if you if you educate people about about security and really what you're trying to kind of prevent, they'll come up with creative solutions. So when we did this this uh, uh, new business launch, uh, you know they developed all the services in AWS. There's not a single console access to anything. It's all controlled through code. You can't deploy unencrypted services. It'll automatically shut it down. Um, those are just things you can engineer in. And so if it's about educating people what you're, the outcome you're trying to achieve, uh, you know, generally engineers love to kind of solve those problems and then share them and, and so other people can learn from them. So this is how you've re-architected your platform to be cloud native. It's Absolutely. And we did it with a... We built a lot of software ourselves, but we did it inherently with a pretty monolithic third-party insurance suite. Hmm. 
um, that we run completely in the cloud. And I, I had sometimes, at times, I had more problems with them than I did internally because we were kind of pushing them into this. They've now completely converted. They're redesigning their platform to be 100% cloud native. Um, but they were nervous as a, as a software company about the lack of control that, that, they were, that they were giving up. Interesting. So, Stuart, you talked about how on day one an employee comes in and you know, you've got a company like Liberty Mutual or, or any of these companies in the room, and if all of the data is siloed in email, then it's like, oh yeah, maybe I should send you like, a few of these things. Maybe there's a wiki <laughs> or something that like, exists from years ago. How, how does that really work when, when I come and show up on day one and, and Slack's implemented in this enterprise? How do I know where to go look? Do, does somebody tell me? How, how, does, how does all that happen? Yeah, so there's a lot of, um, usually people show up on their first day in the job and they are introduced to a couple of peers, they know their manager, and they begin to start to triangulate the actual social structures. There's almost like a process of echolocation, like you, you mm -hmm. say something and you see who responds. Um, and slowly discern who really makes the decisions, who knows the answers to what kinds of questions. That stuff happens a lot faster. So the, uh, usually in a well-managed um, Slack using organization, there are a set of channels, people have created user groups. If this is your role, you're automatically added to a bunch and then search should be relatively easy and, and you start to discover and then there's a little bit of word and mouth. But um, being able to just have that scroll back over uh, what's happened in the last couple of months for either, like the closest working group, like the you know the five, eight, maybe fifteen person, um, and then the slightly larger uh, groups, either functional, or business unit related, that are having those conversations, super valuable. But maybe even more valuable is starting to detect the social patterns, like the expectations around response times, um, the how serious versus how f freewheeling the conversation is in the different channels. And people come up to speed like just uh, uh, way faster. That's great. So ultimately, you know, I think that this kinds of things we've been talking about so far have talked about changing the bottom line satisfaction for, for people in their jobs, mm -hmm. right? So in today's competitive talent market, how do we, how do we better serve the, the people who, who've joined our team to, to create that, that kind of loyalty and, and, and make it something that, that they really want to be a part of? Well, it's interesting. We've done a couple of things that I, I think it even surprised us in terms of how well they were accepted. So, First, we went and we implemented flexible work schedules, which for uh, an insurance company, uh, uh, Opal from Allstate here would be able to relate to this. If you have never worked in, a, in an insurance company, you haven't worked. I'm just going to tell you that right now. <laughs> so uh, to say we're rule followers is an understatement. Um, so this idea of well, what do you mean they can set their own schedule and if they sit with, talk to their manager? And so we, we did this, and three years later, um, it's the number one satis customer kind of satisfaction metric. All new employees, I, I talk to interns, summer interns, new college hires, they all cite that as the number one reason. Uh, we just re um, uh, introduced a new, much more uh, generous uh, leave program you know, rave reviews from the employee base. Parental and, leave, right? Parental yeah. leave, yes, mm -hmm. yes, parental leave, yes. And so I, I think that's like the experiment we took in the technology. We tried some of these things because we were really trying to, you know, challenge some of the status quo and just really surprised how much it took hold. And it wasn't small groups or small items, how pervasive the, uh, the openness to it was. It sounds like a lot of what we've been talking about actually boils down to just trust. Trust in the people that we work with. Uh, you know, trust that, that people can handle these kinds of freedoms of information, of, of being able to deploy things. Uh, yeah. it, you know, I think that that's, that's really, really interesting. Um, so, so in the whole future of work that, you know, we were, we're titled to talk about, uh, 
and also to, to what Aaron was talking about with like AI being terrifying. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and useful. And right? good, <laughs> and good. So, so last week, my, my former colleague, Sam Altman, proposed an idea on, on Twitter for feedback called American Equity. I don't know if any of you saw this or if any of you follow Sam. Um, but basically, he was saying each US citizen should get a share of the US GDP each year. And the initial feedback that, that I saw when I you know, went and kind of did the search and poked around was like, oh, you're just reskinning you know, universal basic income. Hmm. Uh, and you know, while there might be some, some truth to that, it, I believe that those of us in the Silicon Valley who are quote unquote disrupting, really there, there's a lot of people who have a strong conscience about what this innovation looks like, what does our future workforce look like, and you know, how does the speed of automation kind of affect that? So maybe Stuart, you could answer: Is the future of work less jobs or different jobs? Or no, what, I don't do think so. Because you look, uh, I mean, 150 years, you can see <laughs> the whole U.S. workforce has rolled over its jobs three or four times. Um, everyone approximately was a farmer in 1820 in the United States. Now there's 1.9 percent of the population that works in agriculture. And those jobs are totally different. And this is actually interesting. We were talking about this before. Um, Henry Ford could walk around the factory and look at stuff that just seemed like it was inefficient, <laughs> like this person's walking back and forth a lot. We should move these two things together or split these jobs up. The knowledge work is a lot less easy to inspect. It's less tangible. It's hard to know exactly what's going on. It's really hard to spot those efficiencies. But definitely, people change what they're doing. There's a, this is. I wish I was clever enough to have come up with this, um, but Benedict Evans at Andreessen Horowitz pointed out this 1960 movie called The Apartment. Jack Lemmon, Shirley MacLaine, and uh, Jack's job is to sit at a desk. He's got an electromagnetic adding machine. He's got a typewriter. People come by with a little trolley, a sheaf of papers. They hand it to him. He looks it up. He performs a bunch of calculations. He types up the results and hands it out. And there's these incredible shots in the movie of like just like rows and columns of desks that stretch out into infinity. What is he? A cell in a spreadsheet. I mean, in an absolutely literal, very straightforward sense, the whole floor of this office building is like one worksheet, and the whole building is like a giant Excel file. And no one does it anymore. I mean, I hope we joked about this a little bit. <laughs> Hopefully, there's very few people <laughs> doing that exact job now. Um, probably around the same number of employees. Uh, right. Hopefully, a lot more efficient. Um, and the well, that would it's like we're seven steps away from universal basic income, which is probably a good idea. Um, but I don't; th those jobs are just not going to go away. I mean, and it's there's always new opportunities. I, when we think about AI, I think I agree with everything Aaron had to say. Really, less about uh, replacing a human and more about augmenting. So most of you are close enough to my age that you probably remember. Um, Texas Instruments calculators being introduced into schools. So like there was one point where you should right. learn how to do arithmetic by yourself. You should learn how to do long division. And then you can just immediately forget how to do long division forever. Um, <laughs> some of us are blessed with the good arithmetic ability in their heads, and that can be very useful. But mostly, it doesn't matter. It's mostly better that you learn how to use a calculator. You learn how to use Mathematica, if that's your thing. You learn how to use Excel. Um, and you let the computers do what computers are better at. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity just around, and I'll, I'll wrap this up, I apologize, but uh, the 30%, and I'm making that up, of knowledge worker time that is spent finding the answers or asking uh, the questions around basic factual issues. Like, who is this person's manager? Um, you mentioned, like, what is our revenue for this unit in this quarter? Who has a good contact at this customer company? Even, like, where is the paper for the copier? That kind of stuff. But a lot of it is, is not, we're not actually applying human intelligence and creativity. We're doing these, like, rote things. And um, to the extent that technology is able to help there, I think there's huge upside. We have this experience as consumers where you start typing your query to Google, you type a third of it, it's already predicted what you were going to ask. You hit enter, and then like 700 milliseconds later, the result is unboxed. Um, unfortunately, it's actually much harder when you have less data to search and you have less 
um, interactivity from humans and fewer people involved. But we're, uh, I, don't, I don't mean Slack specifically, we and the people who have 500 times our R&D budgets are, um, are making some progress um, on these problems. And you know, imagine in a future where rather than people getting pestered uh, like and constantly peppered with these questions that they have to answer, or going, you know, trying to find the person who knows the answer to this question in their 180,000 person company, um, infinitely patient bots who know, you know, have perfect memory, who don't aren't bothered or disturbed by this, and can just answer the same question, same stupid question, over and over and over again. How do I do my 401k something something? Um, where do I go for whatever? And and that, as mundane as it might sound, I think is like the source potentially of double-digit productivity increases over the next 20 or 30 years. Cool. Um, does anybody have a question for for Stuart or John before we we wrap up? Uh, game never ending. You can take another stab. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the background of the question is: me and some colleagues started a game company, failed. We made Flickr. We started again. It failed. We made Slack. Uh, no, I'm done. This is good. I, mean, no, I knew no, this for the next time? 20, 20 or 30 years. Charm. Yeah, no, <laughs> too hard. <laughs> All right. Chat bots, actually, inside Slack for, for real chat bots, where we take yeah. something mutual does with thousands of pleasure weeks. Um, mm. We haven't seen yet ubiquitous in, in this customer base people doing that inside Slack, but everyone's using Slack and then they're using TV next to it. Do you mm -hmm. see that as being kind of a next logical place for Slack to go? Yeah, I, I think for that, a lot of the AI stuff. Um, Chatbots as a way of doing stateful query construction, because some people, well, for most people, it's hard to, to construct a query that's going to find exactly what you want, especially with a whole bunch of operators. So if you can refine what you're looking for, your question, what you're looking for in the context of a conversation with a chatbot, I think that's great. A lot of it is um, chatbots that have zero intelligence, and they don't even have like Eliza from 1965. Um, but that's OK, because I don't want them to. I just want to be notified. I, we have a help desk system that's totally integrated with Slack. I put in a ticket, I get a response back from the bot. I can respond to that, but it's not a conversation. Like we're not friends or anything like that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just a better update mechanism for those kinds of notifications. And I think we'll see huge uh, amounts of implementation of that kind of stuff. So it's surfacing a workflow. Um, and it, you know, it really can be as dumb as a notification, and that can make a huge difference to your life. Because you think about, you get an email from your HRIS or from your expense tracking system, click the link, browser opens, app starts to load, you get bounced to SSO, you off, you come back, and then you're allowed to press accept or approve or reject or whatever it is. Um, but that can just come in the message itself, and you can approve or reject it in the context of the message without a separate authentication step. That's not chatbots like they're smart, but it's chatbots like they're useful. Yeah, I completely agree, and I think chatbots are the best and the worst thing that you know are out there right now in terms of, I think all those examples, perfect. It's, it's this kind of the extrapolation of, and they'll be able to do everything. And I'm like, if you can develop a chatbot that can talk to my mother and understand what questions she's asking, I want to invest. <laughs> right, because she calls customer service and it's this whole conversation and like she's not gonna, you know, it's very narrow. I love my mother, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's one other thing that I actually, I, I wanted to, to, to kind of wrap up with, uh, with you, John, and that, that was in, in this whole big experiment that you did, um, there was something about the way that you prepared for it that, that really spoke to me. And I think that this applies to anybody in this room. I think it applies to um, startups, especially when they get to that first, you know, kind of like breaking point when you get like that many people and you, you hit all those little spots along the way. And that was how you, you approached this as leadership in, in doing something like this. Yeah, I mean, we went and it, it was a gamble. We went to the, our, our business partner and pitched this idea and tried to set a realistic expectation of just what it would be like. But it was, it, it felt like a lot less control and a lot less uh, certainty, right? But in the end, it, it was more. And so we got them really engaged from the get-go to where they were bought in and they were out there promoting this and pushing. And so, you know, when ever we ran into an internal obstacle, you know, we were, we were a unified voice. And so the leadership team 
was set on what are the objectives, and then the other part was we got out of the way for the rest of it. We were very clear about what success looks like in a very kind of tangible, measurable way, and then we let the teams decide how to achieve that success, right? They knew they had to achieve certain implementation goals, certain sales goals, and then it was go figure out what the best way to do that is. So you did the work up front? Absolutely. Well, that's great. Thank you both Thank you. so much for, for coming and being here.